Hi, I'm Dr. Ron Lehman. I'm a spine surgeon at Columbia University and the Ox Spine Hospital in New York City. And I want to take a few moments to talk to you about bone graft as well as selecting the patient in order to optimize their chance of success. So I think there's certainly many things to consider. As we often say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So if we get it right the first time, especially in primary cases, how we approach the patient in terms of technique, implants, as well as biologics and bone graft are incredibly important. The first time we do the surgery, in a primary case, they have much better outcomes than revision surgeries. Certainly one of the things that we want to really want to consider as we think about how we're going to approach each individual case. There are several different things we consider when we're talking about achieving a successful fusion. The first thing is really the individual patient, and that needs to be defined. Certainly cases where the patient has other medical comorbidities are incredibly important to understand and appreciate ahead of time. In addition, we not just want to discuss the patient, but also the site, the procedure, and the need for active or passive grafts. This is incredibly important as we really choose the graft for the patient for the procedure. And this is individualized for every single surgery that we perform. There are many different challenges that we talk about when we consider fusion. Factors involving graft selection are incredibly important, but it really comes down to the patient. Like most things we do from a clinical perspective, if the patient does well, we all succeed. So look at the patient, find out the challenges. Does the patient have vitamin D deficiency? Do they have other metabolic bone conditions? Also the site itself. If the patient has osteoporosis, that's a patient issue, but it's also a site issue. We know that obtaining fixation in that particular patient may be a little bit more challenging. Have they had a history of radiation to that area? Another consideration when we talk about this. And then once again, the procedure. What procedure are we performing? Are we going to use autograft or allograft or something that's much more active and helps to replace some bone grafts? One of the questions that we often ask is, what's really inside the bone graft package? I think there's several different categories as you can see on the left hand side. Synthetics, demineralized bone fiber, and then cell-based matrices as well. But we really have to look about what's invisible. What's the composition, what's the surface technology, and what's the ability of the FDA in terms of regulatory to look at what's actually in the package themselves. Another consideration is what bone graft and what role does it play in the procedure itself. There are two basic categories. One's an extender, so things that we can add to the local environment in terms of local autograft to help achieve a fusion. And at this point, there's really only one replacement, RHBMP2, which can help us replace the bone graft needs. Another consideration is what level of activity is actually required for your procedure. As we look at things like procedure, host, and what type of operation we're going to perform, our graft activity really increases. And so we go from a passive to a more active role. In addition, we have things that are highly active. So cases that are much more challenging comparatively, especially with larger constructs, these are considerations we want to really want to look to when we choose our graft. In addition to looking at and addressing the challenges to fusion, Graft activity is incredibly important, and we really want to match the gap between the fusion requirement for that particular patient versus the bone graft that we're going to use. More challenging cases require a much higher graft activity. As we look at the culmination of all this information, we really want to have a patient-focused graft selection. In order to achieve fusion and avoid pseudoarthrosis, we have to consider the challenges. These really include the patient, the site, and the procedure we're going to perform. In addition, we want to make sure we have a good biologic strategy. Look at the gaps between the challenge of the host as well as the activity of the graft itself. And as we all know, the first chance to fuse is really the best chance to fuse. So when we do this right the first time, we're going to really prevent revision surgeries in the future. Thank you for listening to this discussion, and ultimately I hope all these considerations will really help us achieve better success for our patients in the future.